Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and really, a quick note, I actually did, before this trip, um, in 2008 I was teaching high school, and between two, sum or between two years of teaching I did a cross-country trip, and I stopped through the Adventure Cycling headquarters in Missoula, Montana, and they do, um, they have sort of a system where when people are riding cross-country, um, they have a running wall that they restart every year, and if you're on a cross-country trip, you can go into Adventure Cycling and they'll take a Polaroid of you and then they'll tack it on the wall and so they just have a running list of all the Polaroids of all the people who are on cross-country trips. So. But yeah, so uh, yeah, but just a plug for Adventure Cycling. They also do classifieds actually, like almost like ads, like seeking a partner to do a trip from here to here and they, you can post, if you're interested in doing a trip with somebody, you can post and the magazine will publish your little, you know, uh, kind of personal type ad like oh this person's looking for a partner maybe I can ride with them so um, but yeah so th thank you again for for being here everybody um, I am gonna just sort of introduce myself and the the sort of ideas behind the trip we had sort of a couple main goals and I do want to just put a plug in for my two trip mates um, because they can't be here tonight um, typically I actually do this presentation with Eli in the center there. He and I uh, live in the same house in Burlington. Um, and uh, so we finished the trip and ended up getting a, a place together. And Noah is actually down in Asheville, North Carolina now. So um, so Eli is actually on a, on a trip with his family out in the Pacific Northwest this week. Um, and, um, but, but both great guys, I, I met both of them. Um, over a decade ago when I was teaching actually and had done that cross country trip and Eli a couple years after I rode cross country uh, he rode cross country by himself and we started dreaming about this South American adventure um, and I said hey I've always wanted to do this trip from South America maybe you want to go with me and so it was way back you know thinking about it started way back probably about a decade ago and um, and since then we got together and Noah was also at that school and was actually my advisee uh, when I was first teaching as like a 22 year old. Um, and so we're about, about five years apart, but, but, but we all sort of figured out our schedules and uh, the summer before, so we left in January and the summer before we all got together and we, we were like, okay, so are we doing this? And we, we bought plane tickets about six or seven months in advance of the trip. We all sat around the same table and, you know, purchased our plane tickets. So it was like, okay, we're doing it. And, um, but the couple, I guess, main goals um, of the trip, obviously, um, and I can't speak uh, for, for all of us. I would say Eli and I are absolutely obsessed with cycling. Um, Noah is obsessed with adventure. Um, so there were times when, you know, there are dynamics that come into play there, but we all wanted to go on an adventure. Eli and I were particularly excited about the, the pedaling part. Um, and, but we all wanted to, to go from point A to point B. We had, we gave ourselves a year to do it. But the second and maybe more important goal was not just the, the sort of feat or the, the goal of making it from Ushuaia home to Vermont. It was really more about people. Um, and when I rode cross country, I had people put me up in their homes and offer me meals and um, you know, folks in restaurants saying, you know, the tab's on us, don't worry about it. Good luck on your ride. You know, there were sort of little random acts of kindness all along the way. And I had, you know, I grew up in Vermont, I grew up in Addison County. Like I said, my dad's from Northern New Hampshire, you know, so we, I, I was used to this area, went to UVM um, and have had the privilege to travel quite a bit, but you always think, oh, well, people in the South or the West or people in Mexico or people in China are different, you know? And it was my experience anyway that on that cross-country trip that the, the thing that sort of popped out was more sociological, that people are, people are people, you know? They want to be good neighbors and they want to look out for each other. And there are, you know, there may be things like poverty or, you know, substance abuse or things that cause folks to, to need to, you know, do things that, you know, they might not want to do, but when it boils down to it, people want to be, I believe people want to be good. And, and so that's sort of why we called it Mundo Pequeño, um, or small world in Spanish. And it's not that we had a, a prescription of, we're going to say, you know, that this is for a certain, this trip is for a certain um, philanthropic purpose or that kind of thing, but more 
we want to be open to the idea that people are good and, and will be generous and open to us and can we try to be intentional about observing that along the way. And so, you know, uh, spoiler alert, but that's what we found. And, um, and uh, it was an amazing trip and experience and, um, you know, and just the, the folks that we met along the way and the generosity and, and just kindness and sort of openness to us was, was really incredible. Um, so, um, when, when you try to do a, uh, a presentation for a year-long trip, it gets, um, it gets tough to sort of articulate everything that's happened in that span of time efficiently. And so we found that, you know, trying to narrate a slideshow slide by slide was very difficult um, to actually cover the, the length of the trip. So we have about a 25-minute um, slideshow slash video clips. Um, I'll, I'll put a warning out there. There are a couple expletives in the slideshow because that's part of a trip like this. Um, and um, so you've had warning. I'll give you a, you know, I can raise my hand if anybody needs to, you know, do earmuffs or anything. But, but we, um, I also, this is not like a high production value thing. So I was, I was saying to my dad, I was like, you know, I think maybe I'll just make a crack about the fact that when you're on your bike in the middle of nowhere, you don't get like a soundtrack all the time. So, so you all in the, in the slideshow portion of this, you'll just have to, you know, sit with yourselves and think about what you might be thinking about if you were in these places. So it's about 20, 25 minutes, um, and it'll be chronological from start to finish with um, sort of annotated with dates and locations and that kind of thing. Um, and so usually it's just best to show the slideshow to start and then open it up and have more of a conversation in Q&A. So, all right. Thank you all. Um, yeah, and so that's just the, I had that up there before, but um, this is Ushuaia really quickly on the route. Um, so this is Ushuaia, Argentina. It's basically the southernmost city you can get to. Um, it's in, in the jumping off point for Antarctica. Um, this is actually in Argentina here. So this little section is in Argentina. And then we cross back over to Chile, cross the, the Straits of Magellan on a ferry, and then up through mostly Chile and then Argentina, sort of back and forth across the border, but all through the sort of Patagonia region, uh, coast of Chile, and then up to Bolivia, uh, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, a boat over to Panama. This area right here is called the Darien Gap. It's really not um, passable uh, on road. You can try to, you know, hike your way through the jungle, but it's really not um, doable on a, on a bike very easily. Uh, and then all through Central America. So Nicaragua, or excuse me, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. Um, right here you can't see it, but Honduras and then El Salvador right there. Guatemala, Mexico. And then we went through Houston, New Orleans, uh, Asheville, and then up through sort of the Blue Ridge Parkway area and some of the big cities. Um, I lived in Northampton, Mass for a bit. We did a, Eli and I did a two day cyclocross race because we just couldn't get enough biking in, but we had a, um, and then we finished uh, up at the Canadian border, um, north of Burlington, so. There's the, the route. Um, we got a lot of free socks, which was cool, and a free pair of sunglasses. Um, those were our only sponsors, but you know, they're good ones. Um, and yeah, um, so we'll, we'll kick this off and then have time for plenty of questions afterwards. Si cada uno de nosotros sí. eh, cuidáramos nuestro pequeño mundo, sí. creo que sería el, la solución de, del mundo, del, de los países, de los pueblos.
¿Todo bien? ¿Todo bien vos? Sí. It's a little windy out. I'm having to hold my tent up. Yep. I don't know if you can hear what it's like out there. I'm gonna give you the right away. <laughs> Dude, my bike's not moving. Oh, like twenty k of this. It's like twelve miles. Casual twelve miles. And we got three and a half more hours to do it in. Make the ferry. Hey Eli, what's going on here? <laughs> We're just uh, Eli's having a little rage. <laughs> he was like, if what? I can't what? fucking ride 70k <laughs> to the nearest town, I'm gonna oh, try to burn down the cabin that I'm sitting. No, no, don't joke about that. That could be a potential outcome. God damn it. I can't breathe, dude. Yeah, well, it's not smoking anymore. <laughs> Me encanta la gente joven y que salga adelante y que sean grandes.
Eli, what are we doing? Uh, You're on candid camera, by the way. Doing the longest climb on the, the trip in a jungle. And it's dark. It is dark. Trying to climb. About 3,500 meters today in 80 kilometers. And this is how it ends. Let's do Columbia. <laughs> Puedes hacerlo. <laughs> Otra vez. <laughs> oh no, solo este. <laughs> ah, buen trabajo. <laughs> Did you pick up three crazy guys on bicycles? Uh, you know, why did you choose to do that? Or I, I didn't realize it, and when I saw you, it's like, yeah. okay, I think these guys needs needs a ride, so and we can Hell, do it. It's, Hell uh, is the best going in the it's, world, it's, no? It's, and why not? I would like. Oh boy. You're gonna, you're gonna go? Where are they, hombre? Which is based on the fact that everything's connected, that the well-being of one is only reflected in, my well-being is only reflected in the well-being of the other. So that if something is off, if the earth is ailing, or if there's um, a marginalized people who aren't doing well, then my well-being is at risk. And so we're all in it together. <laughs> ¿Cómo te llamas? Medardo Lindo. ¿Qué es? Medardo Lindo. Medardo Lindo, mucho gusto. Soy Cameron. Sí. Y uh, uh, no sé, solo como algunos, hace algunos minutos uh, estabas uh, dando jugo de naranja sí, sí, claro, para claro. nuestro viaje y uh, queríamos uh, a preguntar por qué la, el, la enoracidad a nosotros cuando. El, la mayoría del, de, de nosotros los hondureños sí. este, eh, creemos bastante en, 
es nuestro Padre Celestial que es Jesucristo, sí. ¿verdad? Sí. Entonces, todos somos humanos y merecemos ayudarnos mutuamente. Sí. También necesita, en vez de queremos saber de la cultura de ustedes, y sí. por eso los entretenemos un poco también, sí. Sí. ¿verdad? Pero sí, por eso, porque ustedes vienen cansados de su viaje, más largo, sí. y seres humanos como nosotros, Perfecto. somos hermanos. Sí. Perfecto, sí, entiendo. Toma. Sí, simple. Sí. Muchas gracias, hombre. Muchas gracias. Do you want help? No. He he just said no. He said he doesn't want help. Oh. <laughs> that was a good save. Supremes, they don't have like any puncture protection. You advertise that they're like kind of puncture proof. This is a fucking like half dull piece of glass. This is bullshit. <laughs> uh, I'm not impressed. With me? <laughs> they got this fuck to whatever the fuck is up there. Okay. If that's what you want to do. <laughs> what you guys are doing is people are bestowing acts of kindness because they're also interested in learning from what you've seen and experienced. So I think it's a two way giving situation, whereas they are giving a free meal or hosting you, or but you're also sharing adventures, stories things that other people can't always go and experience yep. um, and showing the beauty of the world like the, the nature and the fact that you've been so determined and have achieved your dream I think that is also gives hope to people in time to despair or We're back with Pat here, and uh, he was gonna tell us a quick story about uh, biking when he was younger. Vacation. I was on vacation. I was 17 years old, and I took my bicycle with me. Went from Grand Rapids, Minnesota, to Detroit Lakes. Oh, I think you got it. It's about 127 miles. Okay. Uh, I stopped overnight. It didn't get dark till about 10, so I stopped, set up a pup tent, took a nap. State trooper woke me up in the morning, asked me what I was doing. I was like, riding from. Grand Rapids to Detroit Lakes. He said, well, it's a long ride. I said, that's why I'm sleeping. He like, told me about a restaurant down the road. I went, met him down the street. He bought me breakfast, and I continued on my journey. That's great. It was awesome. That's, little that's little exactly acts of kindness. To, yeah. yeah, little acts of that kindness. That was good. That's it was great. good. Nice, nice people. I mean, people in Minnesota, they're friendly yeah, and all yeah. get out. Yeah, that's awesome. We've had acts of kindness the whole way. I bet so. you guys... All a sorts of stories. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Perfect. yeah. It's like I gotta check out your time. website. Yeah. Nice talking nice to, you. to talk to you. Pat, it's great to meet you. All right. Thank you so much. Have Be careful. Day. All right. No, take thanks. care. All right. Bye. We were pumping up tires at the side of the road and uh, ran into Barry here and uh, found out that he's from. Uh, Montpelier, Middlesex area in Vermont. Um, so that in itself felt like a, a small world connection, but we were hoping we could maybe just ask Barry, you know, about his travels, you know, back in the 80s and, and now and, you know, experiences of that small world idea or, or whatever he, he wants to share. So, so. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think one of the things about 
being from the States is, is how lucky we are that we have the opportunities mm. to make decisions, to do the kinds of things that you guys are doing, to reach out to people and be in other places. And it's, it's really an unusual and, and very special kind of opportunity. What's incredible is, is just the, you know, I've spent almost three and a half years going around the world on two big trips and then um, my wife Elise and I have been doing about a month long trip every year for the last 17 years in South America and Europe and all over the United States and the opportunities and the people you meet are just wonderful yeah and it's so much fun to meet you guys because I read about you about a month ago <laughs> Vermont Sport so cool. good so on cool. you cool. <laughs> like cool. super awesome yeah. well it's a pleasure meeting you and thanks so much for taking a minute of, of your time to hang out with yeah. us on the side of the road and we'll see you back in Vermont maybe. Okay. absolutely <laughs> fun. So great thanks guys <laughs> I found is yeah def I mean it's interesting you go away on your own to be to an extent on your own but you find that when you you immerse yourself in a situation where you're just doing what you're doing a network of people instantly springs up around you and if you almost I've thought of it in terms of surrendering and if you surrender everything you've got to doing something like this like traveling or being on your own you find that everything's given back and I've had like incredible experiences of generosity and meeting people and totally defying all stereotypes that I had or that I'd been told about before coming and yeah I was saying to that lady back down the road like I've yet to meet someone who I've been like okay I don't want to talk to you anymore it's everyone I've met has been like well, except for us except for you guys <laughs> yeah except for you guys yeah so I guess that's what I have to say And okay. I saw you guys bikes out, and uh, for about the past few years, I ride a lot yeah. in Connecticut and other places. And whenever I come across people touring, I figure I'd give back to some people who helped me out like 30 years ago. Yeah. And just give you 20 bucks for a meal. Yeah. Uh, well. So I want you to enjoy it. First immediate family. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. We're fucking here. <laughs> Where are we? Hey, Berkshires. Who's that? 41, it's my dad. Hey Jim, hey, how's it going? It's going well. Good. Welcome back. Thanks. Okay. So there he is. He is outside. Good. Cold. It must be cold. <laughs> hey dude. I'm gonna stop. Hello. Okay, well thank you all for taking the time to watch that and again pardon the expletives. Um but um, I think now I don't have anything, you know, no agenda really. Usually it's best to just open it up to, to questions and we can sort of take the conversation wherever. But does anybody have a, a question? Yeah. How much did your pan yards weigh? How much did they weigh? It's a good question. Um, it actually really varied. We started the trip all with four panniers, two front, two rear, and then like a tent bag on the back, a handlebar bag. I don't know if you noticed, but the I, I just had like a square, sort of smaller uh, waterproof handlebar bag, and the other guys had more of like a handlebar sort of roll. 
Um, and we, you know, there were times at the beginning of the trip, we were pretty heavily loaded. We had, we all had our own tent, uh, all had our own stove. You know, we sort of, with a trip like this, not knowing, you know, you sort of plan for, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, as far as, you know, group dynamics and hoping you're gonna stay together, but you also, you know, we each wanted to be able to be self-sustainable, especially at the beginning. Um, and so we all had all of the gear that we need, would need to go on our own, basically. Um, so at the beginning, probably the bikes plus, you know, the gear up in the 100 pound range, 80 to 100 pounds. Um, when we went into Bolivia, that really sort of desolate, sort of barren section where it looks like desert, that was heavier. That was the heaviest of the trip because we had, we packed 10 days of food and we packed enough water to go like two to three days at a time. Um, so it was, you know, 10 to 12 liters of water plus. So that was probably well over 100 pounds. Um, so, but the panniers themselves, I don't know how much each, but then by the time we got to the States, we had all dropped our front panniers. We were just using rear panniers and a handlebar bag. Um, you know, when you're going that far uh, and riding that long, it's like you end up wearing the same thing every day, washing it out at night when you take a shower, um, and then you're clean and you just put your street clothes on and you wash those once a week, you know, or whatever. And so we didn't really need that much stuff, especially when we were in the States. So um, when I was riding cross country, actually earlier before this trip, I, I mean, I was very, very lightly packed, just a couple tiny, small back panniers and a handlebar bag and then my tent across the back. And that was, that was it. So yeah, good question though. How about the bikes? Talk mm -hmm. about the equipment that you have. Yeah, I mean, are totally. there special bikes and, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the tires, the tubes and, yeah. I mean, at 1200 miles, yeah, I mean, it was, um, yeah, they it definitely specialized equipment. Um, I would say my bike was definitely like kind of the Cadillac of the, I was, I, I spent the most money on my bike, but there were benefits to that. So I had a, for folks who are familiar with bikes, their most geared bikes have derailleurs, a little sort of thing that hangs down in the back um, that shifts the gears. And I had an internally geared hub on the back of my bike. It was called a roll-off hub. R-O-H-L-O-F-F, -F. it's a German made 14 speed internal hub. So all the gears are inside the wheel basically and it sits in an oil bath. And that basically enabled me to have on the outside what looks like a single speed bike and a really heavy duty chain and sprockets that were both reversible. So if they wore out, I could just flip them over. Um, the, guy, the other two guys had regular derailleur um, bikes um, that wore out. They had to change their derailleurs chain sprockets, chain rings, like 1500 miles into the trip, like in the first month and a half, because the roads were so washboarded and rough that they just, and, and gritty, um, and we had a lot of rain and grit, and so it just destroyed the drivetrains really fast, with, especially because those chains and those drivetrains are much lighter gauge, so my single speed drivetrain, heavier duty chain, whereas they were driving, riding on 10 speed, 10 speed chains, so much narrower chains. We all had uh, the same tires, um, 26 inch wheeled. So like sort of old style. Now we ha everybody rides 29ers and, and uh, 27.5 wheels for mountain biking. Um, 26 inch wheels were the old standard mountain bike size. That's the, the size we were riding on, partially because of durability. Um, a little bit smaller wheel, you know, uh, is less likely to maybe come out of true, have issues with spokes and all the weight. Um, also because they're sort of ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Down in South America, the switch to 29 inch wheels is not, it's not as far along as it is here. And so we knew that if we did run into trouble, we could always find another rim or a tire or whatnot. Um, but those tires that you saw that we switched out on the border of Texas, those are Schwalbe Marathon Mundials is what they're called. Um, and they're two inch wide, 26 inch, pretty, pretty burly tires and they're incredible. I mean, they are just really, when in the beginning of their life, I mean, you can ride through glass, you can ride through anything, you're not gonna get a flat. Um, you can stick a tack in it, it won't, it won't flat. If you, later in the trip, once they've, I think partly just the rubber degrades after, you know, that much time and sun and weather, um, we did get to a place in Mexico just before we changed them where there were like, these thorns that were deadly. I mean, we, um, 
you had to be really careful to make sure that you were picking thorns out of the, the tires and, and keeping an eye on it. And we, we both had, or we all had um, tubes at that point that I think had 12 to 14 patches in the tubes. So we were like, just, we got like the economy pack of like Chinese made like a hundred patches with a bunch of glue. And we just like, you know, had to limp the tires along till we got to the, uh, to the border and were able to, and so we had, it's, you know, difficult to ship stuff to like Mexico. And so we actually, we arranged to pick up packages at a bicycle shop. We had, um, tires ordered to a certain bike shop in Laredo, Texas. So we knew we just needed to get there and then we could switch things out. So yeah. And then panniers or lead panniers, uh, were the ones that we use for the most part. I had Caradice bags, which is sort of a duck cotton pannier in the rear. Um, but yeah, lots of, lots of sort of custom pieces of equipment and, um, you know, camping gear and stoves and stuff. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So, so yeah. You, what are the statistics on flats, broken spokes? Uh. <laughs> you have a Zero broken spokes. Oh, wow. Zero. Um, all the wheels, uh, so the bike that I got, it's called a Thorn. Uh, it's a British made. So uh, yeah, that's another thing. All the bikes were steel framed. Uh, another just durability reason, a um, little heavier weight, but you know that like everybody in South America knows how to weld, like the farmer is going to fix it. Everybody's kind of their own engineer. And so if you run into an issue, you knew you're going to be able to fix a frame. But um, we had, I mean, I don't know how many flats a piece there were, they sort of came in waves, you know, and then once we, um, I wouldn't say more than 20, like, well, 30 to 40 each maybe, which is all things considered, not that bad. Um, there was one day when I was speaking of the thorns, when Noah, it's, he's not, it's not fair cause he's not here to defend himself, but, but he got up in the morning and we looked at his tire and Eli and I like, or we had camped in this area that was full of these thorns in this, um, in this valley. It was actually in Peru. It was this area in Peru, this, um, this, uh, gorge that we were going through and they were just really deadly to the tires. And so we were like, no, have you checked your tires? Have you like literally hand gone around and pulled them out? Because that's what you had to do. Otherwise you were going to get flats. And he, he like looked down and he's like, yeah, I think they're good. And we got about half an hour down the road and he flatted and then we pulled it off and we blew the tube up and there were six flats in one, one go. Um, <laughs> and so there was, there was some karma there, but yeah. So this whole trip was about a year, right? Yeah, almost a year. I mean, it was under a year. It was a year for this trip is fast. Um, it's, uh, there were a lot of people that me, we met particularly going south from sort of Alaska or the West coast somewhere. Um, and they were going all the way down the West coast and they were taking, most people were in the two to three year range by the time <coughs> they got to Patagonia. So, so um, week, no, no, no. I mean, we, no, I wouldn't say, you know, we had the right equipment and, um, and spokes. There was one time when, so Eli, he and Eli's a bike mechanic and, or had been. And so he, built, um, my bike came with hand built wheels. Like it was sort of a custom order thing. Um, Eli's bike. So quick terminology, I'm geeking out on bikes here, but hand built wheels versus machine built. So a machine can build a wheel with all the spokes and the spoke nipples that go into the, to the uh, rim and basically screw them on at a certain tension. And, and it's like, okay, that's good to go. Really the best wheels are a wheel builder. Somebody will hand, hand tighten, and make sure that because just by imperfections in the manufacturing or whatnot, somebody hand building a wheel, tensioning it, and then, you know, detensioning it and, you know, getting it true, um, is usually the best result. So Eli built, um, the two, uh, the sets of wheels for his and Noah's bike. Um, and we had one time where Noah's rear wheel got all wobbly, like a bunch of spokes went loose at once and no one didn't realize it. And Eli was like, what's going on here? But he can and, but we tightened everything up and no broken spokes. Um, so yeah. 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 Speaking of that, like how, how much bike part stuff did you choose to bring with you from yeah, the get go? For sure. Um, we had a lot of extra, I mean, I had, 
um, different like shifter cables and brake cables. Um, we all had an extra one of those burly tires because if we got some kind of like catastrophic, you know, cut, across, you know, through a tire that wasn't fixable, um, we all wanted to have our own spare. Um, and then, you know, as the trip went on and we basically, I mean, it's, we started in the most sort of, you know, uh, desolate and, you know, hard to reach areas and, and without services or bike shops. And, you know, even just with, I think, you know, how trading works and getting supplies to, even to Argentina, it's really hard to get like certain types of tubes. Like they, they're getting 29 or mountain bikes, but they like can't get 29 or mountain bike tubes. Like it's like crazy things like that, you know? So we started with a lot of extra supplies. And then as we got into the States and farther North, we, we dropped a lot of things. Um, Eli's family came to visit him in Cusco, uh, Peru. And we sent a bunch of stuff back with them. So we sort of, there were periods of the trip where we were able to connect with family and like, you know, send stuff back um, home. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how many miles did you do like on average each day? Good question. Um, that was also sort of a, like a weighted, uh, you know, it was sort of, um, weighted to the, you know, each end of the trip was different. So in the beginning when we were on those crazy dirt roads and it was really bumpy and there's more climbing and we had more weight because it was, you know, we were carrying food for three, four days at a time. Sometimes, um, we would do between 30 and 50 miles a day. It just really depended. And then when we got into the States and we had flat ground in the States and less weight, and smoother rolling tires, we could do 125 miles a day. Um, so uh, it really varied. But we, when we planned the trip, we sort of anticipated, okay, let's plan on X number of miles a day average for this section, and then we think we'll get faster, both because we're gonna be in riding shape and because the roads are gonna get better. Um, so we sort of, sort of weighted it in different ways, but yeah. Yeah. When you were in down, you know, in South America in that sort yeah. of single track area through yeah. the woods. Yeah, good question. Was that the only way to go or was that the no. way you chose? No, it was a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so actually, let me wonder, I could actually pull that up on map, which is going to be kind of cool. So if we go, I think I mapped it correctly. Um, there is an overland crossing that we had read about um, that goes from between um, Argentina and Chile. And so there's this gap here. And we, we had heard about it, we had read about it, and we knew that it was doable. Um, and basically, it's, you, can't, you can't take this route in a car, but it's, um, there's a hiking and biking trail and so that morning when we had woke up, it was right at this sort of B marker here. Um, and we woke up at like four in the morning and just started riding up this dirt road. Um, and that road ends at this little lake. Uh, and then we hopped a ferry from there and there are no roads beyond that, so there's no map. But um, we took the ferry over here. This is the Chilean and Argentinian border right here. Um, and that's the single track section right through here. Um, and so we pushed our bikes up and over the border. We checked out whenever you're in down there in South America, there are, there's sort of a no man's land section between, um, border guards. So there's an office for Argentina and you're like, okay, we're leaving. And they sign you out. And then you go another five or 10 miles and you find another checkpoint for the, the country that you're coming into. Um, so the, Argentinian one was here and the Chilean one was like over here on the coast and you know, you're just on your own in between. Um, so that was the single track section and then we camped um, right down here. And if you, you remember the part in the video where it was really loud, there was a ferry and it was sort of rocking, um, like a big diesel engine, uh, but just like a fishing boat, took us all the way up this channel to O'Higgins. And then it, from O'Higgins, um, a lot of the rest of that road, this road all through here is called the Carretera Astral. And it's like a, it was only finished just in like the 90s, um, but it's a, a long basic Chilean road through Patagonia. So, 
really beautiful. So. The blue, yeah, so that, yeah, that was our path, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we had read about um, that section on blogs and just knew that it was doable, so. Go back, back down. Mm -hmm. Where you got on that ferry, if there aren't any roads, where did the people come from to get on the ferry? <laughs> well, there was a little, like, a camping area here, and there were um, some tours, like, um, boats that would travel over here, and there's some glaciers. Oh. Uh, over in this area here. We didn't get to these glaciers. Um, uh, one of the other, Fitzroy is a very famous like climbing destination. So El Chalten, where we started from on that section, um, is a big time, like big climbing town, mountaineering town. Um, and so this part is in, we're in Chile here, uh, or excuse me, Argentina here. Um, Calafate is um, the sort of jumping off point for um, Parito Moreno, which is uh, this glacier right here. So this whole, see that right there? That's all a, a glacier. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, that was the picture you saw of the glacier was right there. Yeah. I'm okay. just yeah. curious about what percentage of the route did you pre-plan and uh -huh. what did you plan sort of on the whim as you met people yeah. or, or yeah. you know, around the road? Um, we had like the general we're gonna, you know, head up the west coast of South America and then we're gonna cross over, you know, to once, you know, it was, the point was to ride home, you know, we wanted to do it that way. Um, but I would say that it also depended on personality. That's where you get into like group dynamics and, you know, because I'm definitely more A type planner, like I wanna know where we're gonna be in two weeks. My dad's chuckling because we went on a motorcycle trip and I was like, I was like, Dad, where are we sleeping tonight? And he's like, I don't know, I'm on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, what's wrong with you, son? Just chill, you know? Um, and um, <laughs> he's like, I gotta work and plan all day. This is, this is, you know, just calm down. Um, but so I would, you know, I would wanna know because we were gonna, like, you know, it was sort of a, you know, that was a struggle of like, um, getting back in a year and knowing we only had a certain budget and if we wanted to get home by that time with th those monies then it was like okay we have to keep a certain pace so if we're gonna keep a certain pace we need to know where we stand and we need to plan um, then again there were times when we were like screw it we're tired and we need to take a day off or we're gonna go visit this thing that we didn't know about until we got here um, so I think it sort of went it went both ways um, but it was generally, I would say, like a maybe a couple weeks ahead. Uh, we had like major benchmarks, and then when family visited us, you know, there was times when we were like, "Well, we need to get to a such and such a city by a date uh, because we know they're coming in, and we're either gonna have to bus for you know a day if we can't make it there, or we got to stay on schedule." Um, so, yeah, it was a balance. But. So was it pretty seamless going from country to country? Because sometimes you hear that you can yeah. often run into some dynamics with yeah. uh, border patrol and all that kind of stuff. How, how did that all play out? Really was not an issue. Cool. I mean, people people ask us about that's like a very, very common question. You know, how are the people, how are the different countries, you know, and there are different, you know, there's different character to places. Like people, you know, there's between Argentina and that, you know, and, and language is really different. I mean, I speak pretty good Spanish and, 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 you know, got a lot better on the trip, but it's definitely very different uh, dialects from, from Argentina to Chile to Colombia to, you know, so. Um, and then just cultural differences between, like, some areas being more social and then we're in rural Bolivia, you know, in more indigenous communities and there they might be not, not hostile, but just more shy about like, okay, so who are these folks coming into our area? So, but we never had hostility in like a, a way that where we felt, you know, threatened. Um, I'd say that, you know, traffic and trucks and, you know, angry drivers, um, regardless of where they were from, you know, was the, the biggest sort of feeling of, you know, uh, insecurity, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. That was, uh, yeah. Kind of Meaning more like border, border to border. 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 Yeah, border. I mean, there are dynamics between countries like, you know, Argentina and Chile definitely have like a, you know, a rivalry. There's tension a little bit between, um, you know, Bolivia and, you know, is a poorer nation. Um, but there's not, I think, 
you know, and I don't know if it's the reason that their the borders are are separated, particularly in southern South America, but they're not really interfacing with each other. They're you know, you're just checking in with one set of border patrol agents. It's not like you're in the same you know setting with folks from different uh, countries. So yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was fine. I mean, it was really, it was, you know, the first days that Trump was in office was when we started the trip. Um, so, you know, I remember listening to to um, This American Life and listening to the, the country bands and, you know, the people's stories of like the seven countries that were put on the list of, you know, and, you know, having a little bit of an existential like, oh my gosh, here we are, these like privileged white male middle-class Americans, you know, and uh, able to do a trip like this and um, how is that gonna land with people and, and, but we, I feel like part of it may be that we were, we were pretty, um, you know, we're not coming through in a big SUV or being flashy, you know, we're on a bicycle um, and I think that can be pretty, uh, it, it makes you more vulnerable and, and with that, I think people feel like you're more approachable and aren't threatened by you. Um, and I think that's true anywhere. Um, but I, I also think that people know that, you know, they can separate. We sort of think like, oh, if, you know, regardless of where you are politically, like that's gonna, you know, uh, that's going to dictate how people think of me as a US citizen. And I would, I would say largely that's not really the case. People can separate you know, you from where the politics of your country may be. And we always felt like people were like, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, he's kind of crazy, but like, yeah, cool. <laughs> you know, like we're just, we're people and yeah. you know, that's, we're not gonna let that come between us, so but yeah. I was gonna say that, yeah. I shared with you that we were in Chile. Yeah, you were just down there, and, yeah. And we were like, civil yeah. or like, <laughs> and what we, what we heard from people was, we don't like your president, we like your people, we just don't like your president. <laughs> Yeah, and so I mean, I mean, I think we, you know, there were places like in, you know, in Mexico, for example, that's a different dynamic than in Argentina and Chile are pretty far removed and they may be, you know, have a commentary, but it's not like, you know, here's uh, refugees from Guatemala, you know, or here's, you know, folks from Mexico where, you know, so I think that there was different, even though I still think it was true that people were like, you're not your, you know, you're not your president, we can separate you from that. Um, it was more on people's minds, you know, the front of their minds than yeah. northern Latin America than southern. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, sorry, I'm going to ask. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there was any points that were like really like scary and you were like, ah, I can't believe I'm doing this, or yeah. maybe things you couldn't have planned for. Um, I mean, there were, we all had, um, you know, a couple, like some sickness, you know, GI stuff. Uh, so we all crashed at least once, um, like not bad ones, but we all ate it uh, at least once on the trip. And, you know, so I think not scary in like a we're feeling threatened kind of way, but just um, run down and, you know, fortunately, like we planned things like we, we got prescriptions for antibiotics before we left, you know, and had those with us. We had clean, like, needles in case we needed to go to a hospital and we wanted to use our own, like, we were pretty well prepared in that regard. Um, so we didn't feel like, you know, we were underprepared in any way, but I think that, like, emotionally and the challenge of, you know, I would say, like, this region in southern South America where you know, at this point we had been riding as far as, you know, as long as it took me, I rode cross country in like 40 something days, you know, and this is 10 months, you know, and so you ride, you're like, okay, so we've already basically done, done a cross country bike ride and we still have most of a year <laughs> to keep going and I miss my family and, you know, I miss my nephews and, you know, my parents and I want to, I just want to be home, you know, so I think for me the, the homesickness part um, and, grappling with that and then you're I mean it's we joked about like we're like a we were like a a, a couple or a, a threesome you know that was you know sleeping in the same vicinity 
going to the same job every day, you know, eating together, cooking together. I mean, we were, we were very uh, much sort of on top of each other for, you know, and we would go, we actually did get to a point where we were, we would say, okay, we're going to meet in this town a week away. See you there. We'll reserve this Airbnb and, uh, you know, the re reservation's set and I'll see you in a week, you know, kind of thing. But I think, you know, the, 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 taking care of your, you know, emotions and, and group dynamics and all that piece, um, just for being out for that long a time, I think was the biggest, you know, challenge probably. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. speak Spanish, did Eli and Noah also speak Spanish? Not really, no, I, yeah, it was, I mean, it was, honestly, it was kind of, I got the better end of the stick in a lot of ways just because it was, because I spoke so much more Spanish going into the trip, I ended up speaking a lot more Spanish because I was translating. Um, and so, I mean, they picked up Spanish along the way, but I think I probably improved more just because I ended up being the one to do a lot of the talking and translating. And then when we were together, because they didn't speak so much Spanish, we would speak, you know, we spoke a lot of English. So we tried to, you know, you know, do, do our own like Spanish time, but they would also, you know, in their time away, you know, when we were separated and whatnot, um, they were able to get by and I think were surprised at the fact that they were able to sort of, you know, manage with the level of Spanish they picked up. So, so. yeah. How, how do you get your bikes and your gear down down the place? That's a good question. Yeah, that was a bit of its, its own adventure. Yeah. <laughs> um, we actually so. 48 hours before we were supposed to fly out, um, we were notified that there was a baggage embargo on the flights that we were supposed to take and we were not allowed to bring bike boxes on the planes. Um, and so we were understandably a little freaked out, like, okay, what are we going to do now? And then, so we used uh, Bike Flights, which is a bike, you know, uh, transportation company. Um, but even so, they, they're really not super well versed in shipping bikes from from Vermont or the Berkshires where they were to Ushuaia because they basically FedEx hands off to a local courier company and there's some you know there's a different tracking number and there's no great communication between the different agencies and so we we actually ended up I don't even know how it came about we ended up intercepting my bike in Buenos Aires we were we flew through there because we knew we weren't going there on the trip and while we were that far south, it's like, okay, well, let's spend three or four days because it, it makes sense flight path wise. So we flew through Buenos Aires. I got my bike there. First, we found out that it was in customs there and it would have just continued to sit there. Uh, the other bikes continued on with a courier company that we didn't, you know, we didn't fully know what was going on. Um, so we took my bike from Buenos Aires, went to Ushuaia, and then we had an Airbnb down there and we were waiting for the other bikes. We didn't know when they were going to arrive kept trying to talk to the courier company and we we basically uh, the Airbnb that we stayed in they were very very nice people who basically said yeah whenever your bikes arrive we'll let you know we went and camped in a in a park and um, like a national park uh, and then our bikes arrived and we went to their house and used the garage and built the bikes back up and then took off so it was it was only you know several day delay but but we didn't have to ship them there yeah so, yeah so We were planning to, yeah. And then because of, yeah, I think it was because of the holiday season and extra luggage that people are carrying and whatnot. And they just, it was, it was basically a rule about no over, over, you know, a certain, you know, total dimensions kind of uh, limit. So, so, yeah. So, yeah. There's a film about two guys who traveled around South America. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful film called Motorcycle Diaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. I love that film. It's about how, for me, how these two guys changed over the course of their miss and mm -hmm. non-miss adventures. Yeah. I was just wondering for you, Yeah. how did those lands and those deserts and those mountains and those people maybe change you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I think that, you know, I can't, I can't speak for Noah and Eli, and I wish they were here to to also answer that question because I think it's probably something where we we all have our own you know reflection on that I think me personally and not to make light of it but I think I've become maybe more like my dad over the course of that trip in that um, in in the sense that 
you know, I think that you with, and this isn't true just of a, one thing I, I came to learn and at the first I kind of resented, you know, people who are traveling, it's like, you gotta live for the adventure. And I think the one thing I like to say in presentations is that you can have adventures that, that aren't necessarily geographic. You know, you can learn through experiences that, that aren't traveling. You can, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a job that challenges you or part of being part of a community or whatever um, initiative. Um, so that's one thing I thought a lot about, sort of what, what does adventure mean and what does, you know, a journey, you know, how do we define journey and adventure? Um, another piece is um, I think lots of times in life we can be worried about uh, control and, okay, so, you know, the, the heat needs to be at the right temperature and, you know, the, um, the furnace better not break and what if the pipes freeze and, you know, or, uh, and I think uh, when you're on a trip like that, at the beginning of the trip, you know, we're riding into those headwinds and your ego's getting to you and you're like, what the, oh my, why am I doing this? You know, it's, it's um, and then you realize, you know, uh, obviously that you getting angry at the wind isn't gonna keep the wind from blowing. And um, uh, so once you, you know, six, eight months into the trip, there were times when, you know, like those monsoon level rains in, and we like, we couldn't dry our clothes out in Central America. I mean, they were just humid all the time. Um, and it was gross. And, and there were times when we had like climbs that we couldn't ride up because it was pouring rain and there were dirt roads and there were like little rivers running down the roads and you're, you know, you could be like, um, I'm really upset right now. But by that time we were all just sort of like, okay, this is what's happening. You know, this is just part of it. This is just what's happening today. And you just, you sort of let go. And I think that that in life is, it's liberating to, to get to a place where you have the humility to recognize you can get upset about things that you, you know, can or can't control, but there's a lot of stuff in life you can't control. And so it's not really worth losing sleep over, you know, so. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of the pictures look really desolate, the country you're going through. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, did you try to uh, do as much, uh, point your travel so you would have interactions with the folks that were living along the way? or? Did you, or did yeah. you like try to try to emphasize um, in a place where you could stop and talk to folks, or we just sort of let things happen? We really just sort of let things happen. I mean, in southern South America, it was really focused on you know the sort of the wild and the you know the nature of Patagonia. Um, I mean, in southern Patagonia, you can drink from the rivers. There's you don't have to filter water or anything. The water is coming off of glaciers, and it's clean and you can camp anywhere. There are lots of, you know, wild open lands. And we were, you know, we sort of wanted to take that in. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I mean, we wanted to go to certain cities um, like, you know, La Paz in Bolivia was pretty incredible. And, you know, um, places like Cusco, but it wasn't, you know, lots of the interactions we had, I would say were in you know, oftentimes poorer places um, where folks were, you know, more maybe used to relying on each other. Um, or the one where the, the guy from Honduras was talking, he, that was right at the Honduran border, um, just at a little, you know, shack where he, had, you know, he was selling um, just like a tiny little um, sort of shed, like a uh, corner store establishment. and. Uh, but we didn't. We really didn't go out of our way to say, "Well, we're going to find people here, find people there." It was sort of where we went. Um, and it sort of reminds me of another um, reflection, I guess. Uh, back to to your question, you know, one thing that I have thought some about on this on that trip was sort of how we place value. A lot of times, it seems like in in our culture, at least this has been my experience. And I think that you know, in Vermont, we sort of pride ourselves on being community minded, but but in sort of first world culture, independence is, there's a real premium on independence. You know, you have your own dishwasher and a fridge and a washing machine and a dryer, and you don't need anybody to help you and you have your own bank account and you've made it when you don't have to rely on anybody. And 
in a lot of these countries, you know, working class countries, uh, not working class, you know, poverty, you know, folks are in poverty or they, and if they're going to have a family, they have to rely on the neighbors, you know, or their family members, you know, it's like, here, hold the baby. I got to wash the clothes or, you know, kids are playing in the street or this is happening, you know, and I know, I mean, when my dad was in Colombia, I feel like a reflection of yours was that, you know, people are out like in the squares and socializing and having an ice cream together and or sweeping their house or, you know, whatever it was. My dad asked me, I remember we were riding through Columbia, he's like, is Wednesday sleep sweeping day? And I was like, no, pretty sure every day is sweeping day, you know? <laughs> and, um, but I think that for me, that made me think a lot about sort of how we think of, of the idea of wealth um, and what does it mean to be wealthy in material or in independence or in sort of the, the community fabric. And so it may be, a you know, it's not an either or question. I think you can recognize, you know, that there are folks who are hurting in other places who don't have resources that, you know, I may have the privilege to have. But, but is that always as simple as, uh, as we sometimes think about it? So. Yeah. Very indiscreet question. Yeah. How old are you? 34. And how old were you when you did this? 32? 31, 32? When did I finish? Uh, yeah, so 2019 is most of 2017. So I was 30, um, two, 31 and 32. Yep. When I did this. And the two guys I was with were 26 and 7. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was working in but politics. Um, that's uh, so I I worked actually for the Vermont Democratic Party for two cycles, um, and I knew that after the 2016 cycle I was gonna move on um, to do this trip, and so I had we all saved for a good for you know for quite a while um, to make it happen, and we planned ahead, and um, but it took you know four or five years of you know, talking about when, what's the year that we're going to take. Um, and I was, so it was, it worked for me because the position I was in, I was like the statewide field director basically for the party, uh, for the Democratic Party. And so they didn't need a campaign person and I knew that I wanted to go and they knew that they didn't need that, you know, position filled. And so it actually was, you know, mutually, uh, it worked out. Um, and then, yeah, I work at UVM now, um, but I was Christine Hulquist's campaign manager in her governor run. So, um, so I came back and then I met Christine and then it was like, okay, here's another adventure. <laughs> you know? So different, but that's what I mean. You can have different kinds of adventures, um, not just geography, but yeah. Just wondering what kind of wildlife you saw. Um, I kind of wish we had more uh, videos of some of the wildlife down in Southern and South America. There's um, there are, I don't know if, if did you see guanacos? Oh, yeah, <laughs> they're like they're they're weird calls that they make. Yeah, so they're these like camelid type animal like um, you know um, like alpaca you know and they're they're all throughout like the Patagonia region. The interesting thing about that region is there are really no predators. There are no like poisonous snakes. Bugs, you know, bears, you really don't have to worry about that kind of thing. Um, we, I mean, obviously we saw, you know, animals like in the jungle in Costa Rica and that area. A um, lot of dogs. Um, we actually used to talk about, um, <laughs> we used to have a term called dog parties uh, because at night, like, there are when you're sleeping in a rural town in South America where there's no animal control, there's like the domesticated dogs that are in the houses <laughs> or locked up and then the dogs that roam the streets. And the dogs, I think, that are in the houses, you know, know that the other dogs are like, you know, walking down the street. And so we would be like trying to sleep at two, three in the morning and you just hear like the, the ripple of dogs being like, what the hell, you know? <laughs> you guys are out, yeah. But, yeah. <coughs> Birds. And birds. Um, we did see some. Yeah, we saw some pretty amazing birds, um, especially in 
I'd say like northern South America and Central America, just huge colorful birds and parrots and you know. Um, we did see condors in southern South America, huge, um, yeah, just incredible birds. But, um, but yeah, the guanaco noise is, is a good one. It's just that they have this like squawk of like a, a call that I, I'm not gonna try to recreate it, but it's like, it's pretty unique, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I know that there's that video about the bolt, with uh -huh. the bolt, like did you, about the what? The bull, like the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, you, um, did you encounter, like, was there a lot of experiences like that? Like that? No, that was actually pretty unique. I think um, Noah got kind of unlucky in that, that video. I was maybe a couple hundred feet up the road. I had already ridden by the bull, and so maybe I pissed him off, and then <laughs> Noah was like the next one in line or something. He was like, what's happening here? But, but no, so... So I was, you know, like, oh, everything okay back there, you know, but, um, but that was Noah videotaping. And um, yeah, so we didn't, we really didn't have anything like that. We did, my dad could probably relate to this. We did have a little bit of a, if you weren't used to the culture of like wild dogs, um, that you didn't know whether they would come at you. Um, so we all had like dog sticks basically, like batons, because, not because we wanted to hit dogs, but because like, you know, sometimes you felt like you had to posture, to, you know, to show like, you don't touch me or, you know, you're gonna get it. Um, and that, and I think, an, you know, another thing with the, with the dogs, sometimes they were owned by, you know, or they were like part of a ranch, you know, so if you're in the rural area, um, they're really protective of like boundaries of properties. Um, and those were, but most of the dogs we ran into, like in cities, they had enough stimulation from, you know, bikes and people and different stuff that they weren't going to, they weren't going to bother you. Um, but the dogs sort of out in the rural areas that were protecting big, you know, ranch or, you know, cattle lands, that kind of thing. So, yeah. How did you resupply the food? Um, it depended on the area. In the beginning, um, we, we could, there's, um, in, in Patagonia, in most of the, like, shops, they, most of the shops were also their own bakeries and they would have pancitos. Um, I don't know if you had like little round breads um, that you could like, you know, you could chop them down the middle and, and make sandwiches out of them. But we would, we would make like, <laughs> you know, we would get half a dozen of these little breads and make sandwiches with avocado and cheese and salami and, you know, vegetables and, and do like a big spread and then like stack them back up and put them in a bag and then it'd be like one every two hours kind of thing. Um, and then we ultimately we learned that like breakfast and lunch were best done independently because we could, sometimes we got, you know, we knew enough where we were going that we didn't always roll out at the same time. We didn't say like, we're gonna wait for you to roll every piece of your tent up. It was like, okay, I'm off you know, and we would just start riding when we were ready. And so doing breakfast on our own, we would like, somebody would heat up water for Nescafe, um, very important. Um, and uh, we joked about coming back to Vermont and secretly making Nescafe lattes with condensed milk, <laughs> just make them really strong. And like the people on Church Street would be like, what is this? This is very you know, charge $7 a cup or something. Yeah. Um, but um, we, so we did lunch and um, breakfast independently. We could do sandwiches and then we would rotate who was responsible for dinner. So especially in the beginning, we would carry like three, three dinners you know, one for each of us, and then we would have three nights of dinner taken care of, and then we would do like a resupply. Um, but we would pick, you know, up the breakfast and lunch stuff whenever we needed it, whenever we were stopping. Um, when we got further north, uh, so Argentina and Chile are more expensive than, and so is um, Costa Rica, honestly, the most expensive places. Um, but Peru, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, most of that region and most of Central America, Street food is super cheap um, and worth, you know, it's not the difference between going to a restaurant and going to the grocery store here at all. Um, so it didn't really make sense for us to try to navigate big markets or super, you know, supermarkets. When we were exhausted and just needed to eat, we would just, um, you know, roll into town later in the trip and do like the meal of the day for $1.50 each and have a full meal 
And we also learned that to, to fend off hangriness, um, when we first got into town, we would have number one dinner. And um, <laughs> then we would set up camp and then we would go back out and have, you know, second dinner because because <laughs> then we wouldn't like kill each other when we were setting up tents and you know finishing the day. So, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Was your Viking strategy to like like take one day off a week, or how, how did that dynamic work out? Or uh, that's a good question. Uh, you tell maybe you yeah. for ten days, and all of a sudden you guys all said, "Oh man, we're like fried. Let's take mm -hmm. a day off." Or did you? It really depended. Yeah, we, we didn't have like a set strategy. Yeah. It really depended on sort of how we were averaging. Um, sometimes, you know, we would we would split up here and there, or some people would finish hours before another. Um, we um, we did actually do our last push. Um, I didn't. We didn't take a break from Asheville, North Carolina, until the Canadian border. Um, so it was no days off from. Yeah from that section, in that section. Part of it was because we did that bike race in the middle, but, um, but th that counts as biking. So, um, but we, yeah, I would say generally it was a day off every, you know, more like 10 days to two weeks probably. Um, but some days were harder than others. And, you know, if we recognized that we were all beat, um, sometimes we would do a 20 mile day and be like, this, this sucks, we don't want to bike today. It was like, do we all agree? We're done? Okay, we're done. You know, and we would, you know, sometimes we would splurge and, you know, get a hotel room and eat a lot of food and go to bed early and yeah, so it just depended day to day. Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts on what your preparation, mental, physical, technical planning would yeah. look like differently if differently. you had a trip to do over? Um I think the the most important thing, I mean, I would say that probably the biggest, um, and I, th I think that everybody would say this if they were here, you know, that probably the front end sort of what, you know, sort of mindset planning of, you know, I was referencing like I was more type A, I want to do this in a year, felt like I only had sort of the resources to do in a year. Um, and I think Noah, had he, you know, been able to, might have taken two years. And I think that that, especially early on in the trip, caused us, you know, some friction. And I think that, like, he would say, like, yep, I would have taken longer, <laughs> you know, if he were standing here. And it's not that anybody was right or wrong, but I think just if you're going to do something in a, in a group, you know, if there's a pair, there's one relationship to manage. If there are three people, there are three relationships to manage. And so the complexity of that um, is something to think about. I think systems-wise, we were... Eli and I had both ridden across the country. We knew bikes, um, and we, you know, we had both built bike wheels and, and you know, torn apart bikes and put them back together. And, and you know, we're, you know, we were all in good, sh you know, decent shape. Um, so I think that that side of it, I don't feel like we were, you know, there was a lot of necessary planning that we didn't do. But, um, but. Yeah, but I think, you know, you could argue that, like, we would each have come more to, you know, like, maybe Noah would say, yeah, I wish I had ex anticipated these things, and maybe I wish I had said, let's think about this, is, do we actually want to do this trip in a year, or should it be done in 18 months, you know, and so I think just um, sort of thinking about how the dynamics of the day-to-day are going to influence you know how you're feeling on the trip and your ability to like we didn't we couldn't stray from the route too much we just if we were going to do what we set out to do we couldn't take a bunch of side trips because we had to sort of stay the course so yeah so i was going to ask did you get lost but you pretty much had your, your yeah layout. we 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 really didn't get lost and we also had a lot of um you know doing this trip 10 years ago would have been very different than it was for us today i mean we had the benefit of technology and I had an international cell phone plan that was really affordable um, that uploaded all my photos to the cloud when we had internet. Um, we had offline mapping. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but GPS does not need a cell signal. Um, you can be in airplane mode and use GPS. So if you have the map downloaded, um, you know where you are on the map using GPS. Um, so we were able to, so maps.me is an offline mapping program. 
Um, that's a good one. Um, there's also iOverlander, which is sort of a, um, a program that uh, folks who use like Land Rovers and you know big like Unimog you know vehicles who go sort of overlanding is what they call it, you know driving around all over. They use these offline maps um, that also have markers like there's a swim spot here or this is a great place to pitch a tent and you can like look and be like oh well there's some campsites there and if you have Wi-Fi or service here are a couple photos you know so we had a lot of resources um, yeah. What did you average, you know, before the trip, miles of bike riding, you know, per day? What, like, what kind of training? Did you, you know, to training? What would you say? I mean, I ride? probably, I still ride my bike a lot. My bike's in the back of the car. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I probably ride, you know, four or five days a week anyway, um, maybe more. Um, I'd say that before the trip, it wasn't so much big miles because I was working in campaign world where I didn't have a ton of time, but I would fit in, you know, 45 minute rides most days, you know, kind of thing. Um, I had done, you know, plenty, uh, plenty of like century, hundred mile plus rides. Um, uh, but Noah, I mean, Noah started the trip and the first day of riding was twice as far as he had ever ridden in his life. And he had never ridden with weight. So, um, we took the second day off, but, um, but, 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 but he rode into it, he rode into shape and he was, he was strong, you know? So I think that the thing with touring people don't realize is it's not, it's not like, you know, you're, it's not a sprint. It's really about, you know, cadence, you know, not pedaling gears that are too hard, you know, spinning. Um, and it's about eating, <laughs> you know, you gotta, you can't just be eating, uh, you know, goos and, you know, sugary stuff, you need real sort of fuel like avocados and peanuts and, you know, uh, protein and fat. And so I think that we learned that we ate a lot less sugar than when we started um, and maybe had been more used to like, Eli and I had both done a fair amount of bike racing and, and you know, it was a very different kind of eating because we, we were used to, you know, sort of the drinks and sugary stuff. And then we switched and we would, you know, take an avocado out and cut it in half and pour a ton of salt on it and just spoon it out and, you know, and then eat a bunch of peanuts. Um, or we would, um, we made a lot of hard boiled eggs, salted hard boiled eggs are good. Um, and they keep really well. Um, so you can keep them for a couple of days. Um, and yeah, so. Maybe one, one or two more, anybody? Or we can call it too, whatever. Yeah. Did you use yeah. a solar charger for your? That's a good question, yeah. We, um, Eli and Noah had solar chargers. I think they had small ones for like little battery packs. Um, but we actually, I had um, a hub charger. Um, so the rear hub was internally geared. The front hub um, was wired um, up through the, the headset. Uh, so the head tube of the frame of the bike and there was a wire so that the hub was generating electricity and then the wire would run up through to the top of the cap on the, on the top of the headset and there was a little USB out. So, and it was a trickle charger. And so the thing with um, batteries, like, you know, rechargeable battery packs that you get, um, they put out a certain current that is a lot higher than I could put out on a bicycle. Um, and most devices, like a phone, needs electricity to flow into it at fast enough a rate that it will charge. And you can't, so you can't go directly from the hub motor straight into a phone, but you can basically, they, had, they call it like a catch battery. And so you can trickle charge the little battery and that battery can do uh, enough of a rate to the cell phone or to you know, your headlamp or whatever. So I would trickle, trickle charge and then periodically um, charge things off of that, so um, yeah. So that we did that, but then we also had you know a couple battery packs that we'd use. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all. And again, uh, mundopequeño.org. If you there's my contact information. If anybody has questions about trips or you know wants to talk about places, I'm always happy to be in touch. Um, so, thank you all so much. Are you going back into politics? Um, maybe a little, on, a little, a little consulting on the side, but lips are sealed on that one. <laughs> Thank you all so much.